from Relay FM. This is Upgrade, episode number 488, recorded Monday, November the 27th, 2023. Uh, and the show today is brought to you by Memberful, Ladder, and Notion. I am not Mike Hurley, but I am Jason Snell, one of the voices you're used to hearing. Mike Hurley is on assignment uh, with me as not always, and in fact, quite rarely, is my guest host, James Thompson. Hello, James. Mm-hmm. I'm a Brit, but probably not the one you were expecting. Reference knowledge, there'll be more Doctor Who references later, we promise. Uh, yes. Well, th- it's going to be 90% Doctor Who, 10% yes. Mac. Welcome to Upgrade, uh, a Doctor Who podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we are uh, the, the, the double J. James and Jason are here. I don't know who the yeah. third J would be. Mm. It, yeah, it literally only deployed when nothing is happening whatsoever yes. in the world. Well, I thought I'd make it hard on you by doing an episode of Upgrade where, because of the Thanksgiving holiday last week, essentially nothing has happened. Uh, But we're going to find things to talk about. I suspect when I'm on podcasts, generally, we find things to talk about. Yeah. But before we do that, I would like to do what usually is our Snell Talk question. But since you're here and I'm hosting, uh, and it's the most wonderful day of the year, the most exciting time of the year, everybody. It's Cyber Monday. And while Thanksgiving is a U.S. only holiday, Cyber Monday is for the world. James, how are you feeling on Cyber Monday? Well, I I was at a Thanksgiving dinner at the weekend. So, I mean, I'm kind of, I've already been eased into Mm. it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I have spent, well, actually no money today uh, because Cyber Monday is like Black Friday month now it seems it to is be. Uh, and i i have had so many emails from lego kobo many other companies that ended up yeah sure <laughs> that just keep sending me emails like maybe you didn't buy anything yesterday but maybe you'll buy something today would you like a 500 pound uh lego set uh, well yes but no <laughs> yeah uh, I, I it sounds up your alley it sounds like that's something you would like i don't know where you would put it you don't you're, you're that, flat that is small the, enough that is that the main problem i think you would need a room just fi- literally filled with lego and i mean filled about five feet high so that would be well awkward. people who are viewing the uh video of this will see the there used to be three uh frames filled with lego minifigures behind me there are now six wow, two of which are not currently filled but I'll get that. That's a great promotion for our videos that we do on uh, various channels, as well as sometimes experimenting with the full show on YouTube. Uh, f- by experimenting, I mean sometimes we post it. When we don't post it, it's because something horrible has failed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it's not essential. We, c- we can't see each other here. But even though James has just no. specifically made reference to what's behind him, I don't even know what he's talking about. So no, it's, it's a good. surprise for everyone. Really. It is. It's, that's great. I've, I've been in that room. Uh, I've slept in that room where you are now. But anyway, let's let's uh, Cyber Monday. I I agree with you. I um was watching the Black Friday football game uh, on Amazon Prime because Amazon Prime convinced two two of this country's great institutions, Amazon and the NFL, came together to put a football <laughs> game on on Black Friday for the first time, where there were QR codes everywhere for various things you could buy. I wonder how it did for them, but. I did load one of the QR codes, which just went to a page with Black Friday deals. And late on Black Friday evening, I uh, switched to that tab, or I reopened Safari, and it went to that tab and reloaded it. And what was it? It it had already flipped over to Cyber Monday deals. They just, like, (laughs) next, next up. And then after Cyber Monday, I don't know what's next. Maybe it's literally just holiday buying from that point on. We don't even need to cloak it in a clever phrase. Right. Yeah, I mean, w- yep. when I was growing up, all the sales came after Christmas. It's like your Boxing Day sales. That that we've lost, we've lost the true meaning of Christmas, which is the sales that come after them. It's Boxing Day sales. It's the war on Boxing Day sales. All right, uh, what we want to do here, uh, and I just had this idea last night. I, I decided to go with it. Cyber Monday, Cyber. From a, a period, a brief period where cyberspace, I guess, was a th- thing that people in the general public tried to talk about for compu- buying things on computers, which is what we now just call shopping. But back in the day, it was novel, and so they they lifted uh, a cyberspace, cyberpunk kind of thing, William Gibson esque. Uh, and so I thought we would do a little word association. It's cyber word association. I looked in my dictionary app and saw all the words that start with cyber, and I thought I would get your thoughts about them just quick word association here we go 
cyber law? Uh, my mind immediately went to Robocop. Is he law or is he is he justice? Is it law? Is he order? I mean, <laughs> law, law and order, Robocop. Edition? I mean, <laughs> he's kind of Judge Dredd, but uh, more metal. But right, it's the American Judge Dredd, Robocop. Yeah, I think that's actually pretty fair. And, and nobody gets satire on either side. Cybercrime. Oh, well, Chopper, uh, the most chaotic neutral droid. Oh, from uh, Star fa- Wars Rebels, right? Yes, my favorite droid who. Uh, occasionally does war crimes but is apparently lovable i uh, should have said by the way that these uh, these cyber words were randomized by random.org so uh they're coming in any order no particular order cyber surfing james well i i'm as old as you and my mind immediately went to cyber dog uh, apple's uh, web browser of the late 90s I mean, even calling it a web browser is not quite right because it was open doc, right? So it was yes. it was like a web browser window you could put in documents. It was very strange. And I never understood why they called it CyberDog, although I read recently that apparently it was just in a reference to that on the internet, no one knows you're a dog saying. Um, like, product and- name. I'm trying to remember what it is I was watching last night that had uh, a club called Cyberdog in the background of the shot. Oh, man. That's why it was in my mind. That's but so we've good. forgotten Cyberdog. Cyberdog, um, it was in some ways the epitome of 90s Apple. The, the bad product name, the unclear concept. The We spent a lot of money on R&D trying to develop technologies without actually figuring out w- how they would be used wow cyber dog uh cyber not well the not just to me i thought of micronauts oh my favorite and, toy from when i was a but child we, also I astronauts we, and cosmonauts james those are more common knots <laughs> yeah but i are they real i mean uh i i don't i never encountered the micronaut comics I only ever encountered the toys, and the toys turned up in the discount toy places. So I would go and I would buy quite a lot of these oh, man. heavily reduced, uh, transparent yeah. little people little and plastic guys, yeah, mm-hmm. fun ships and bases mm-hmm. and stuff. And they are probably all still in my parents' attic somewhere, and I need to go digging. You should, and if you don't want them, I'll take them. But you should want them, <laughs> uh, cyber slacker well th- what came to my mind for this was uh bill and ted but the robot versions from the second bill and ted movie i don't know i'm gonna actually open the dictionary for this one but this is there there is not a more 90s word than cyber slacker i think a person who uses their employer's internet and email facilities for personal activities during working hours see we don't even have this word anymore because it's I, I think that's called employees employees yes exactly cyberphobe and I don't know why, but my brain said John Syracuse, because well, he—that's <laughs> just what came to mind. He, he, you know, he, he gives his judgments on various but, things. But he has no fear. He, a cyberphobe definition: a person with an extreme or irrational fear of computers. I guess to know, I think truly he just know them, you must fear them. I think he just doesn't like them, which I guess is different from fearing them. But you know, phobe. Right. You, you can take that in multiple ways. All right, I'll let you. Um, cyber cafe. Um, well, again, I don't know. My mind just went to a robot cat cafe, which I think would be good because I I don't like cat cafes. Well, I like cats, right? Cats are great. Um, right. I don't like cat cafes because all the cats tend to be, shall we say, sedated by uh, a variety of things. Huh. And I feel bad for the cats. I'm sure it's just so that they can have a chill life uh, with all the annoying children running around wanting to hug them. But so yeah, robot what I, cats. What I want to say here, and this is true, is Cyber Cafe is actually a cat cafe. But imagine instead of cats, they had computers. <laughs> so you come in and you can sort of like, uh, d- don't pick up the, the no, Mac Classic unless it gets no, on your lap Just sit down itself. and put, put your hands on it. Um, and I would also say that this is yet another word where uh, Cyber Cafe... A place where you go to maybe drink coffee and also be on the internet. Now just a cafe. 
um, cyber squatting. And uh, Ted Lasso uh, domain names because I had so many Ted Lasso ones that were shown in the show and Apple never registered them, so I registered them. You were a cyber squatter on Ted Lasso branding domain names, which which you, I believe you let that go. So people who are out there who want to get a, from a season one episode of Ted Lasso, a domain that appeared in the background, if you want to own it, you can own it now. Yeah, I, 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 this is my gift to everyone. <laughs> Cyber war. Um, again, the the word that just came into my mind was Twitter, um, <laughs> because that's really all it is these days, and it's nothing that I want anything to do with. But, uh, yeah, it's 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 just a battlefield. Cyber attack. Uh, when I'm in the kitchen trying to get something, and the Roomba bumps into me um it's it should know where i am uh but it's it's not very smart our roomba so you do the thing where where you see the roomba coming and you just uh, it's like the roomba rumba it's like a dance where where you just keep your feet moving just ahead so you can always just sort of like oh it's coming back i'm going to take a step and yeah i do that a lot in the kitchen because whatever timing i have it seems inevitable that when i'm trying to make myself a sandwich the roomba is in the kitchen uh, the Roomba is a great idea for a product for somebody who doesn't work at home, and I work at home like you do, and uh, mm-hmm. it's less good because you have to dodge a robot as it roams around your house. It's less yes. good. Cyberpunk. Uh, Keanu Reeves, the original cyberpunk. Well, that's He's not true. So many. Mm. Well, okay, not the original, but in my heart, yeah, it's your uh, word association. Um, you shouldn't be so oh, judgy. Somebody has just posted a picture of the cyber dog. Um, place which now tell me what show I was watching yesterday. It's you, a shop in Camden. Yeah, you were watching Doctor Who, and it's come back to Doctor Who again because that cyber was dog it Doctor Who is in the it must background. Have been Doctor, Who. yes, it was Doctor Who. Yeah, it seems very of weird because they have Cybermen, and that's not even in this. Uh, cyberpunk, of course, I will always think of. It's a genre of fiction. Uh, William Gibson, yes. Neuromancer, and all of that. But I, Keanu Reeves can be the living yeah, body. Johnny Mnemonic. He was in Twitter. Johnny Mnemonic. Yeah, sure. Cyber. I mean. Store, James, cyber store. Um, sharper image. That I, It was always the high-tech seller right. of uh, Tat when right. I was in the States. And now we would just call that uh, uh, an online store, but uh, but back in the day, cyber store was something special. Cybercast. Well, I immediately think of roboism with Kathy Campbell uh, <laughs> and, and Alex. So, you know, it, that is just some branding. Uh, Cybercast actually is listed as a video broadcast of an event transmitted over the internet. Welcome, everyone, to the Upgrade Cybercast. Only on YouTube, (laughs) though. Here it's just a podcast instead. We don't have the cyber. We're leaving the cyber for CyberTube, which is probably what they used to think they would call it. Cyber Mall. Um, I wrote an abandoned metaverse version of the former Valco Mall in Cupertino. Ah. Uh, which w- was an interesting mall because I watched it over several decades go from a bustling uh, hive of capitalism to uh, closing one shop after another. Then everybody moved up to one level and they yep. started to close and, and then it went away. Um, the the saddest thing I have ever seen um, is... Uh, uh, now my mind is blanking... David Price, yes, David Price, sitting at a small table in the middle of Valco, trying to sign autographs for ten pounds, and there was nobody there. Well, that's not good. Uh, Cyber Mall, by the way, officially in the dictionary as a commercial website through which a range of goods may be purchased. <laughs> you don't say cybernetics, a real word. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well. You know, it's it's a T eight hundred or something like that. Because I don't know, cybernetics. Just now, I just I just think of uh, sci fi things rather than real things. I know now why you humans cry. Uh, Cyberchondriac. Well, I wrote down Marvin the paranoid android, but I mean, he did have a pain in the dyads down his left side, so I don't think he was a cyberchondriac really. Apparently, a cyberchondriac is somebody who ha- who compulsively searches the internet for symptoms. It's the WebMD addict, basically. I get uh, it. Otherwise, you've got known, everything now, now. Now known as human being. Yes, cyberculture. 
Um, I visualized an exhibition of AI stolen art. You know, just just a whole load of things that were nicked from other artists. Nice, nice. The the dictionary definition is the social conditions brought about by the widespread use of computer networks for communication, entertainment, and business. In other words, you're soaking in it. Uh, cyber pet. Um, also cyber dog. Okay. Because <laughs> wow, we came all the way back around. Say, a, 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 I think a, a tamagotchi is a cyber pet. So that tells you how timely that word is. And I finally, keep trying. Yes. They keep trying to bring uh, Tamagotchis back, like their color now. Yeah, well, I mean, sure. Uh, the final word is cyberbullying. And I said, what the Discord does to Mike every week. Yeah, I was going to say, whenever Discord, whenever Mike is challenged in any way uh, that's <laughs> not in person, and honestly, even when it's in person, he thinks that it's cyberbullying. That's not how that works. All right, well, thank you for participating in our first and last cyber word association game um, I do want to tell people that the Upgradies are still open for nominations. This is the 10th, believe it or not, annual Upgradies. You can go to Upgradies.vote. Nominations run until December 5th, so you've got a little bit more time. You've got another week. We really rely on your nominations. Not only is it great to get the voice of the Upgradians in the Upgradies, but also you get to tell us about things that we don't know about. And we'll go, oh, what's that? And we'll check it out. And sometimes that leads to us talking about it or writing about it and and uh, maybe making it a nominee or a winner. So we could not do the Upgradies without your help. Or at least we could, but it wouldn't be as good. So please help us. Upgradies.vote. That episode is coming out on December 18th, a little bit earlier than usual, um, because we've got some other special stuff planned for the rest of this month and into uh, the beginning of next year. So you can see all the previous winners of the award at Upgradies.com, of course. I, I will not try and influence the vote in any way. Okay, good, good, good job. Upgrade Plus, by the way, if you love Upgrade and want to hear more of it, please subscribe to Upgrade Plus. No ads, bonus content every week, access to the excellent Relay FM members Discord, and there is a special deal right now. Until December 15th, you can get 20% off a new annual plan. Uh, you use the code HOLIDAYS2024 at checkout. Go to getupgradeplus.com. Get your first year of Upgrade Plus for $40. Find out more at Give Relay. Dot com. Uh, now, this week on Upgrade Plus, who knows what we're going to talk about, but I'm going to guess it's probably going to be Doctor Who related. Who knows? Who <laughs> knows, eh? Who knows? Let's do a little bit of follow-up. OpenAI, Mike and I decided to take the brave uh, step to talk about OpenAI last Monday, thinking it's probably over, right? It's probably over now and there will be no more news about open ai we i don't think we actually believe that but we thought we could maybe like slide in some takes on last monday and i'm glad we did but just to wrap that up in a bow in case you were not paying attention um they the they the board realized that the whole company was going to dissolve and Satya Nadella, as Mike said, he's a stone cold killer, uh, <laughs> said we could just take them all at Microsoft, which seems like it was basically a ploy to get OpenAI to do what they did, which is reshape the board and bring Sam Altman back. So in the end, uh, I don't know what the net result is other than Sam Altman's back. He's not on the board. The board is still sort of semi-independent. Their weird governance is still there. But I feel like if nothing else, there is now kind of a an acceptance that uh, open AI is going to do what it's going to do, and the board is probably not going to suddenly fire everybody. Uh, this yeah, new board. It, it did seem coincidental, perhaps, that all the women have now been removed from the board. Mm. The, the ones who wanted perhaps to consider the ethics of rushing to ship uh, generative AI products uh, without thinking of all the, the implications of that are now gone. Yeah. So uh, good job. They just they just got in the way, I guess. Get them yeah. out of there. I could say things ironically now that I'm not going to say, uh, right? Because it would all be funny, but also kind of unpleasant. So I'm just going to move yeah. on and uh, mention another thing that uh, is something that we cover on Upgrade from time to time, which is Apple's little holiday films that they released. They released a new one. It's called Fuzzy Feelings. I'll put a link in the show notes to that. Um, and over at Six Colors, my pal Andy Anako wrote a, I think, funny article about 
uh, his journey while watching this uh, this video about empathy that includes it's it's about a a bad boss but is he really a bad boss because like the main character is late for work and the boss says you know you're late for work and is he being mean about it but she's making an elaborate stop motion video in which she gets to uh harm him in various ways <laughs> but in the end she learns that he's a human being which she should have known all along and uh ends up uh, being nice to him at the end so it's a it's a weird i enjoyed it and i think that it's very impressive that in a few minutes it takes you on a whole journey on a whole story arc i thought it was uh, a lot of fun and it looks really great but uh but it is weird <laughs> it's really- i had slightly a different response to watching it um i think that boss uh deserved everything that he was getting in felt <laughs> and life um you know why did she suck it up and be nice to him just because he knitted her a sock he eats alone he's a bad because he's a bad boss a bad human you know i i didn't i didn't feel that he had earned the redemption you know because she i mean i i i thoroughly was impressed by the various murder uh scenarios that she had dreamed up for him because it started with him losing his trousers and then you know go on a bit and he was being hit by cars and and all sorts of things Mm -hmm. and and i thought this is a really interesting apple advert i'm not sure the message is but i'm really on board (laughs) and then and then she she kind of like because i think she was coming in late because she doesn't want to be at work Uh, he's terrible he doesn't like he doesn't let uh, take any of her feedback. You know, he closes the door when she's coming up to try and talk to him about things. You know, d- don't give up on your felt murder dreams, lady. <laughs> so, uh, so you're disappointed that it takes a turn at the end where she learns the yes. spirit of the holiday season and human empathy. Yeah, I think he should have learned something, not uh, her. Interesting. All right, well, that's, that's, that's our follow-up. I feel conflicted about it now. Let me take a pause to tell you about our sponsors this week. Our first sponsor is Memberful. Sometimes taking a risk is the move you need to make to get where you want to be. Have you ever told yourself you're ready to monetize that work that you're so passionate about? Boy, I've done that. Now there's no excuse because Memberful makes building a membership business easy. Memberful has everything you need to run a membership program, including a streamlined and powerful checkout, an easy-to-use member portal, transactional emails, and a member management dashboard. It's all covered. I use Memberful for the incomparable. I use it for six colors. We use it for Upgrade Plus. I use it for Downstream Plus. Basically, look, I use Memberful uh, to make a large portion of my living. And one of the things that I rave about Memberful to other people is that it's all the stuff I didn't have to build. Uh, You plug it in uh, fairly easily. They have an API. I use WordPress and they have a WordPress plugin. I don't have to like set up a separate email thing to do the transactional emails or actually direct emailing my members. It's all in there. It's in a little bundle. You just plug it in and boom, you've got an entire membership program full featured, really just shockingly easy. I, I, I spent a year wondering whether I wanted to ask Six Colors readers to give me money. And a year of just me being timid about it and worrying about it. And when I finally decided to do it, and I'm so glad I did because it's a huge part of my business now, um, I got it working in a week. (laughs) And it was really (laughs) only a few hours to put it together. So a year of consternation and feelings and then almost no time in terms of the technical implementation because Memberful made it so easy. Memberful lets you build the membership that's best suited to your audience. I have different versions that are built in different ways to fit the different audiences. You can do custom branding, newsletters, podcast support, gift subscriptions, Apple Pay, free and paid trials, referral discounts, all of these features that they built. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to build it yourself. They built it all. And of course, there's analytics to let you know what's working and what's not. It seamlessly integrates with all sorts of tools. This is the beauty of it. If you use WordPress, as I do, Boom, plug-in, done. MailChimp, Stripe for credit card processing. Discord, like we use for Relay and Six Colors and The Incomparable. It's just built into Memberful. It's integrated. You don't have to hire somebody to tie it all together. Memberful ties it all together. And they have a great support team that I've used multiple times. They are responsive and super helpful. They are very passionate about the success of their customers. 
and uh, you can always get a real person on the line to ask a question to. So check it out right now to see if Memberful could work for you. You can get started and explore with no credit card required. I absolutely did that too. You set it up. You can't take new member credit cards, but you can do everything else and build it and see like, how would this work and how would it look? And then when you're ready to open the doors, that's when you sign up and start paying for Memberful. Uh, just couldn't be easier. Go to memberful.com slash upgrade. It could be the next great move for your business. Memberful.com slash upgrade. Thank you to Memberful for supporting Upgrade. All right. It's time for the B-Tales. <laughs> woo James, you didn't do the hoo-hoo. Okay. Uh, I, I did, we can I did, put that in in post. I did my own hoo-hoo, and no, we all know how painful that can be. All right. I had a rental car this weekend. I just am telling you a little story. It's vaguely be, beta, beta. I almost said beta. You're doing it to me. It's, yeah. uh, it's beta-related, James. I had a rental car with CarPlay this weekend because I don't have cars with CarPlay. So then I get Not rental sure. cars with CarPlay. It's very exciting. This was a Jeep Wrangler. Shout out to Casey Liss. I was driving a Jeep in the snow in Colorado. Um, and I had a couple of observations. One is the shared playlist feature in CarPlay, which we didn't use and none of my family knew about. And I'm not sure, is it in there in the shipping version? Have they added that? Or is it in the 17.2 beta? I'm not sure. Uh, you don't drive, not, so how would you know? I don't drive and I don't have CarPlay. Not a real and road tripper. And I only installed the 17.2 beta this morning. Okay, well, uh, I, I, it is a new feature of 17, at least, whether it's in the shipping version or not. And I think that would be great because my daughter was trying to pick songs for us to listen to when we were on a long part of the drive and driving from the airport because the airport in Denver is very far away from everything. <laughs> and uh, she's like pulls the USB-C cable as far as she can away from where it's plugged into the car in order to use it. And I'm sitting there looking at the taut USB-C cable. She was trying to <laughs> pick music. And I thought, well, this is the perfect example of bringing up that, that, uh, that share interface where you can have a shared, uh, playlist of what's coming up next and people can add songs to it, which I can't wait to use that feature, but I still haven't used it despite that. Um, but it got me thinking about the other feature that I really want to try, and that is in the 17.2 beta for sure, which is collaborative playlists. The idea that I can make a playlist, and I was thinking about this because I, I used to have a playlist that is at, at various points in a failure of iTunes or the music app. I don't know which. I lost this. It's probably still on an iPod somewhere in my drawer. I could, I could re <laughs> maybe see what songs were on it from that. But it was a, a favorite humorous playlist of mine called Creepy Stalkers where it was good songs and then you listen to the lyrics and realize that it is about very bad behavior by people who really need to just let it go and move on with their lives but it makes for good songs but it's also creepy and i was talking to my daughter about it and she had a bunch of suggestions of songs that i don't know that were also sort of creepy stalker-esque and i had that moment of thinking um this is what a shared playlist is for so one of these days, those collaborative playlists will come out, and I will try that uh, USB road trip control the music feature, which, let me tell you, have, have there been shouting arguments in my life about who gets to choose what song plays on the radio? Yeah, yeah, more, yeah, at least one. <laughs> so this is a good feature, and I'm looking forward to it. But that's uh, that neither of those things have I tried yet, and at least one of them, and maybe both of them, is in the beta. So yeah, I thought... I would slide it into details. This is all about cars, James. So very little relevance yeah. to you, really. Well, I was going to say, whenever we do long car journeys, we end up listening to either podcasts or audiobooks. So it's not something that is like, there's usually debate over, will we listen to my podcasts or will we listen to Saskia's podcasts? And th which are quite different. She listens to a lot of things that are sort of worthy in nature, mm. whereas I listen to things which are mostly about video games. Mm. So right, yeah, that's that is uh, that is the issue. We, we in our four family group, we will occasionally listen to podcasts together, but it's fairly rare. Usually, it's more like let's just get some music on, so we're not, you know, so we're not just sitting there and and uh, listening to the road and occasionally saying something. We do talk, but it's nice to kind of have something in the background, but. Anyway, the, the last time I was just thinking we did put on an audio book um, for, for a long drive and it started, I would say, right in the middle of an extremely explicit scene, oh. uh, which 
<laughs> made for a you know like a 10 minute kind of awkward drive just to turn on the on the defogger it's the, the, like yeah all the windows got fogged up uh, while you were listening Did, what is a long drive for you well 30 minutes hmm. <laughs> I mean, you, you're not minutes. wrong. You're not wrong. Like driving to Edinburgh is a long-ish drive because that's like 45 minutes to an hour. Wow. It's a little island. It's a little island. Yeah. All right. I, uh, In the spirit of Cyber Monday and the holiday season, which is all about uh, commerce, of course, I thought we would do another like quick uh, segment about where we are right now in terms of Apple products. Just a little idea I had, because we don't have news to talk about. Just like, go through the list of current Apple products and say, what would we recommend for people who are looking for something for this season of commerce? Uh, and what will we not? Do you get it? you get the concept here? I, it seems fairly straightforward. All right. MacBook Pro. Start easy. I mean, that seems to be the, the easy one to recommend nice nice new chips yeah um uh full range of things you know you can spend infinite almost infinite amounts of money uh if you want to fully spake one of those um and as we discovered like uh the the high-end max ones they they beat my m1 ultra max studio by significant amounts and that makes me sad yeah, yeah, I think this is the easiest one on the list, honestly, is if you are looking for a MacBook Pro for you or someone else, now's a good time to buy. Um, I, the usual caveats apply. I feel like um, the for all of our, our consternation about that low-end MacBook Pro, I think it's better than what was there before, but I would still say what I said back then is still true now, which is if it's in your budget to go up to the $2,000 model, that has the uh, the M3 Pro chip in it instead of just the M3. Uh, do that because you get a lot more for your money once you break that 1999 barrier. Um, but it's yeah, now is the, now is a perfect time for that. What do you think about the MacBook Air? Would you recommend anybody buy a, a MacBook Air now? It, it is both a great product but also a little bit long of the tooth. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I was thinking about that because I'm. I'm in the. I'm in the market for something, and I don't know what because I. I usually I have the split lifestyle of, I have my uh, Mac Studio, which is where I do all the sort of heavy lifting, and then I have something that I sit on the sofa and answer emails on and things, and that seems like the perfect candidate for a MacBook Air. Uh, but there's just part of me that's thinking, yes, but if I waited maybe until like March. Right. Maybe I would get an M3 MacBook Air. So it's really nice. It's fast. It's decent. But maybe wait. I'm going to come down as saying, um, "Tis the season to buy a MacBook Air." The MacBook Air M2 is amazing. The M3 will be incrementally better, but only incrementally. I think it won't change in any substantive ways, other than the chip inside. I I think. It's already great if it's in your price range. Uh, when you're looking for a product like this that doesn't have the pro chip and the pro features and all of that, like I, I think it's going to not matter whether you get an M2 or an M3 because it's going to last a long time. I really love that laptop. I, I love the design of it. I love everything about it. And I'll also say, and, then, and there's a 13 and a 15 inch version now, which I know that although I always like little laptops, it's a stumbling block for some people. And so to have a more affordable large screen laptop, there may be somebody, you or somebody in your life, who has either shied away from the MacBook Air because of the screen size, or has maybe spent too much money. Maybe they got an Intel MacBook Pro, and one of the reasons they do is just because they wanted a bigger screen. This would be a perfectly great time to get them a MacBook Air. And honestly, if you are on a serious budget, and you want to get somebody a computer and they don't need a lot of horsepower, I think you can find the M1 MacBook Air for like $7.99 now. That's a great I deal mean, on a really good computer that will serve you for years because the M1 alone, it's not the new design. It's the old style design and all that. But you know what? It's an Apple Silicon Mac and it's going to be great. It will, it will stay in service and be a modern Mac for a long, long time to come. 
Yeah, I mean, even the lowest of the the um, Apple Silicon chips are significantly better than many, if not most, of the Intel right. Macs that ever existed. We have this. We have this effect. Um, because this is a tech podcast and it and we are tech nerds and we live in tech nerd circles and sometimes i think we lose sight and this is one of the reasons why I, everybody got angry with me when i talked about low price macbook pros with <laughs> not enough ram uh it, it is some people don't have those pr our priorities and they don't have our use cases and they don't have our budgets and apple silicon like Talking about an M1 Air, I know that there are probably a lot of people out there who are like, oh, but it's so old and outmoded. And it's like, yeah, it's true, but it's also $799. And the person who's thinking of buying it, they probably have some battered MacBook Air from 2016, something like that, right? Like that's yeah. 2015. They've, they've got, I, I know people who, who are replacing computers that are six, seven years old, right? Which, most tech nerds, except John Syracuse, won't do, <laughs> but uh, but people do, and anybody coming from Intel, especially from like deep Intel, deep history of Intel Max, the an M1 Air is gonna first off they they've been proven that they can hang onto a computer and use it for years, and they want to get productivity out of it, and I think once you cross over into Apple Silicon, even if it's just an M1 you are going to get productivity for years. It's going to be a huge boost and you are going to be good for a long time because I think Apple is going to be very good about, um, not only is it a big boost, but like Apple's going to support Apple Silicon for a while. Apple, it, all the way back to M1, I think. I think yeah. the, the support will be solid uh, for the chips that it, it controls. So I think, it's, I think it's a good deal. I think it's a, if, if 799 or maybe even cheaper on sale, like, that M1, like I would choose the M2 if you've got the the budget because it's more modern and it's beautiful. <laughs> but uh, not everybody can do that, uh, or they're buying it for a kid or something. And they're like, I can't. I'm not going to spend a thousand dollars on a. Like I get it. Seven ninety nine M1 Air is a pretty great deal. Yeah. Mac Studio. Um. Well, <laughs> if you're the kind of person that's buying a Mac Studio, you probably would want the m3 yeah. ultra mac studio i agree completely um, i think this is a it, don't buy it <laughs> yeah I do. it, it, it is because it is yes the m2 is good the m3 will be significantly better and i mean as yeah. we've seen like the the m3 just the max ones are beating the ultra for for right. a lot of stuff and, and keep in mind mac studio is ultra and max they don't use the pro chip in the studio. They use the Max and the Ultra. And the Max is the one that is so much faster than the previous generations of Max, where they yeah. really souped it up. And then imagine an Ultra on top of that. But even if you're in just in the market for the Max version, the base model Max Studio, I think you're going to want to wait for the M3 because I'm I'm certainly looking at that and thinking that's going to be a very impressive upgrade. And and those things are so expensive. I mean, like it is a tiny cube that will cost you you know whatever five thousand to ten thousand dollars and like yeah i'm i'm looking at it because I've, I've got my m1 one mm -hmm. and Me too. i i i i love it it's great it's fast and and now i'm seeing that it is slowly falling off the performance curve and i am running into things where it's like it would actually be nice you know, I, maybe I should have specced it when I got it originally with more GPU cores. I didn't think that they were useful. Apparently, they are useful now. And uh, and just to be clear, yeah. the, the the base model Ultra starts at two thousand dollars for the Max version. The Ultra, the you know, the Max is two thousand. The Ultra is four thousand. Right. So yeah, yeah. So it's it's a you you choose your cube of power. Something they yeah. said to Loki at some point, I think. <laughs> Uh, but I would, I, I think anybody who's looking at that should probably wait, right? Because performance yeah. obviously matters to them, or they would get a Mac Mini, uh, where it matters less. Speaking of which, Mac Mini, and I, I feel like I want to say something similar to the MacBook Air, which is I'm sure there will be M3 Mac Minis next year. Well, I'm not sure. I'm less sure than of some other systems, but I think probably. And I, I think if you're in, a, in the market for a Mac Mini, I don't think it matters. I bought a Mac M2 Mac Mini. Uh, a few months ago like i think it's fine because you're using those uh it, for utility if you're using it as a main computer like you know what you need and i think that getting an m2 pro or an m2 base mac mini is not going to be 
like the M3, if it does roll out, I don't think you're going to say, oh, no, I missed all these wonderful features because I really doubt it's going to just be a little bit faster. I don't think it's going to be as big a deal. You could do it. If you need it now, you could buy it now and be okay. Yeah. Make get a Mac Mini under the tree. Mac Pro, what do you think? I mean, I would argue, was it ever a good time to mm. buy a Mac Pro? Solid. Solid. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. I mean, um, if you want to buy it, we're I, not going to stop you. We're not the law. We're not Judge it, well, Dredd and... <laughs> And or whoever we said the American equivalent of Judge Robocop. Was Robocop. We're not Robocop either. No. Um, you have more than 20 seconds to comply. Uh, it is. <laughs> I, I, I just. I mean, if. I don't know what it's for. I think it's because they said we're going to ship a Mac Pro. And so they've shipped a Mac Pro. But the Mac Studio is fine for. I mean, it's the Mac Studio is not a low end computer. Uh and it's pretty pro enough for i think almost everybody uh i i just don't see the point yeah i i i mean if somebody wants it i think that's great it, it i have said for a long time that there is a volume that apple has as a minimum for shipping anything that <laughs> even a mac <laughs> has to you have to sell a certain number of them the mac pro kind of goes against that i'm sure that they are first off they're doing it because they sort of made that promise and they want to and they designed that case and they want to deliver something in that case and i'm sure that they've heard from certain key customers who have io card needs that the compact systems that are kind of like laptops that apple does everywhere else in the mac line now aren't going to fulfill their needs. Although I would even argue then you could probably do it with Thunderbolt in the breakout box, but maybe maybe yeah. there are cases where that's not even true or or you wanted something cleaner than a breakout box connected by a cable. Okay, but like they've got to know how many Mac Pros they're ever going to sell. And it's I, I can't be a large number, but they must think that it's key sites and they already have the case and they already have the chips. It probably is the reason why they never did the quad chip version because uh, it was hard and they're like, we're not going to sell any of them because it's going to cost a fortune. That's what I was going to say. It's like the, the one thing that I think would give it some kind of revitalization is if they did actually put in a an even more ultra chip into the thing. But uh, yeah, for whatever reason, that's not happened. So there's an, for most people, there's not much in it. All right. Next year, no new iPads this year. Next year, all new iPads. So... I think the default answer here should probably be no. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've had people say, should I buy an iPad? And I've literally told them, well, probably not because they haven't touched them in a year. And there's going to be a whole load of uh, catch up you will get, right. you know, in, in the 18 months since the last lot. There is one uh, iPad that I am supremely confident will still be on sale this time next year. And that's the low end 10th generation ipad mm. because even if they come out with an 11th generation ipad they will still sell the 10th generation ipad at a discounted price and honestly that ten if you're if you just want a low end ipad just a replacement ipad and, and frankly i think most people don't who are not very techie don't need anything more than the base model ipad and that's yeah. a really nice they they redesigned it it's it feels much more modern um it's got the Touch ID button instead of the home button on the front. Feels like a modern iPad while being uh, pretty affordable. I, I assume next year it'll come down in price, but still, that would be something that I might recommend to people right now. For everything else, I think I'd say wait and see. Yeah. Uh, unless it's something that you're giving as a Christmas present, um, then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even even then... I mean, yeah, you can do what you want, but like, even even then, you're like, oh, here's this iPad Air that's kind of stale and is going to be replaced with something new next year. Yeah, do it if if it if it makes sense, but um, it, it's not a it's not the savvy choice. It doesn't mean that you know if you see it or get a good deal or whatever, you couldn't make it. Hmm. I, I put the iPhone down here. I mean, they turn the iPhone over every year in the fall. This is why, right? Like, if you want an iPhone, get it. I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, I think it only becomes more of an issue when you because we know what the cycle is you know it's unlikely that they're just going to turn around in july and say surprise new iphones um so it's only when you're like past that six months which i i think in my head of you know like and and you're getting closer to the new phones than uh 
than you are far from the other ones. Uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah. as designed, the, the, the iPhones are great. <laughs> they are. Um, 15, 15s are good. Uh, never a bad time. And then the older models actually are pretty good too. And you get deals on those too. So, but this is their, this is how they get you. This is how they, they design. It's des literally designed so that when people have a conversation like this in, uh, in the, the, the buying season, that the iPhones are all there and they're fresh and they're ready to go. Don't buy an iPhone SE now. Yeah. I think that's about ready to turn over again. But uh, otherwise, and and the Apple Watch is a similar story, right? I think that if you want to get an, a new Apple Watch, well, guess what? They just made new Apple Watches for you, a new series, a new Ultra. And I, I think go for it. I I mean, they did kind of make new ones, but also they kind of seem quite similar to the previous generations. Sure, sure. but if you're so, in the market now, I think you do, you don't need to fear like, yeah, oh, but they're about no, to no. unveil a brand new amazing. Like there's the, even the rumor of the Apple Watch 10 kind of thing out there. Mm. And it's unclear if that will come next year or if it might be further down the line. So uh, I, I wouldn't, in terms of the like, should I buy something now or should I wait because something new is around the corner yeah, no, the the Apple Watch progress is slow, but the latest ones are refreshed and they're ready for you if you wanna if you wanna buy them. You can yeah. do it. I think we didn't mention the iMac. Uh, oh, we didn't. I skipped right over the iMac. We should mention it. Uh, it just came out. I, I think you should buy it, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, you want like, it, unless buy it <laughs> unless you're really wanting a big one, uh, in which case, uh, well, you you're can't not gonna do get anything. it. You're, you're not waiting. Like six months is not going to have I that talk, big thing. Be I just talked to somebody about this who, who I forget, I think it was in a member Discord, maybe the Six Colors Discord. And, and in the end, it was um, their solution was they found a deal on an LG Ultrafine 5K 27 inch monitor, which is much cheaper than the Apple Studio display or the mm -hmm. Samsung display, which I didn't like, but which is comparable to the Studio display and a Mac Mini. And that was in their price range. And the, the truth is that although buying an external display, even a studio display, and a computer is going to be more expensive than buying an iMac, the beauty of it is that that display will last you a long time. And in three or four years or five years or whatever, you could buy a new Mac Mini and still use that perfectly fine display. And that's that's when you start to save money is because you're just buying replacing the computer and you're keeping that display but you do have to buy that there's the initial investment in the display and i know that people are like the ultrafine nobody seems to love the ultrafine but it is the imac 27 inch panel and it looks good even if it's not apple level of quality of build and uh and and then you can get a mac studio or mac studio if you want to but you can get a mac mini and uh, you can put that together pretty reasonably if you're if you're a 27 inch iMac user who is frustrated and doesn't like the 24 inch uh, M3 iMac. Although if you haven't seen it, you should go to an Apple store if you can and see it because it's pretty good. It may be enough screen for you, but if it's not, then then um, I think the 27 inch display and a and like a Mac Mini will give you. I mean, base Mac Mini will give you iMac performance, right? It's yeah, it, it's a, a, a not an M3, but it's an M2. It's close enough. And then if you want a little more performance, you can get the Pro version, which no iMac has right now. So, and if and again, you scale it up. If you want Mac Studio, use the same display with that. The the only thing, the only sort of possible wild card in this whole scenario mm -hmm. is it is the 40th anniversary of the Mac. I know in January. And there's this part of me, because there was the 20th anniversary Mac, which was, you know, right. a ridiculously... I mean, it was kind of like an iMac ahead of its time. It was. Because it was a f flat screen. Um, and to be clear, you know, not 20 years ago, because it was the 20th anniversary of the founding of Apple, not the 20th anniversary yes, of the Mac. Yes. And but, came out a year too late. But yeah. But still, still. you know, 40, 40th anniversary of the Mac, maybe they do something fancy, something nice. It won't be um, it won't be an iMac though because they uh, they said they're not going to do an iMac. I, I, as much as well, I'm skeptical that they said we're not going to do a 27 inch iMac, which everybody would read as ah, oh, but what about a 30 inch iMac or a 32 inch iMac and all that? Like, I get that. The fact that they went to the trouble of reading that statement out to to journalists and reviewers and you know, like I got it. I was sent it right. Here is a yeah. statement from Apple. It wasn't. Oh, uh, dogged journalist finally got a PR person to confirm this thing. It's like, no, they sent out a crafted statement about not doing a bigger iMac. I think that 
implies that it's going to be a while before there's a bigger iMac if there ever is. I think that you, you don't worry about it. But yes, yeah, maybe I, they'll do something wacky for the 40th anniversary of the Mac. It could happen. I, I would like to see them do something different and interesting. You know, maybe like we've talked a long time about convertible things that, you know, could become like it's like uh, an iMac, but it's also a big tablet or, you know, like drawing thing or whatever. I It would be nice if they did something that we haven't seen before. I'm d- I don't think it's likely. Yeah. But uh, it. it's just that day is, because it's the day before my birthday. So I, I always think of it. Well, birthday present for you from Apple. I, I'm going to, I'll make my, I should probably say this for some sort of uh, annual pick uh, extravaganza or a year in preview oh, and all yes. that. But I'll, <laughs> I'll give a preview here of it, which is my wild idea. If they do something pretty wacky for the 40th anniversary of the Mac, it would be announcing uh, new iPad Pros that will run Mac OS in a VM. Or, or they announce for the 40th anniversary of the Mac that they're getting rid of the Mac. Oh, okay. That, well, that's a bummer, but, I mean, you do you, Apple. <laughs> <laughs> this episode is also brought to you by Ladder. Let's be real. We all have a tendency to put some things off until the very last minute, whether it's going to the DMV, arranging a visit to the dentist, uh, getting to the that home improvement project that's been nagging. I have to go to the hardwood store right after we're done here. Uh, Most of the time it works out, but the one thing in life you cannot afford to wait on is setting up term coverage life insurance. You've probably seen life insurance commercials on TV. There are lots of them and think, yeah, I'll look into that later. But you can't wait on something this serious. Choose life insurance through Ladder today. Ladder is 100% digital. No doctors, no needles, no paperwork. When you apply for $3 million in coverage or less, just answer a few questions about your health in an application. Ladder's customers rate them 4.8 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot. They made Forbes' best life insurance 2021 list. You just need a few minutes and a phone or a laptop to apply. Ladder's smart algorithms work in real time, so you'll find out if you're instantly approved. There are no hidden fees. You can cancel any time. You get a full refund if you change your mind in the first 30 days. Ladder policies are issued by insurers with long, proven histories of paying claims. They're rated A and A plus by AM Best. And since life insurance costs more as you age, now is the time. There will never be a better time to cross it off your list. Go to ladderlife.com slash upgrade today to see if you're instantly approved. That is L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash upgrade. One last time, that's ladderlife.com slash upgrade. Thank you to Ladder for supporting Upgrade and all of Relay FM. James, you are a very kind co-host who gave me a topic today. I have to build this. You know, Mike gives me topics. Mike's up. I'm sleeping. It's Monday. It's Monday in the UK. I am just sleeping away Sunday night into Monday morning. And I wake up on Monday morning and there's a show doc. And maybe I've left some notes in places for Mike, but uh, but he puts it together. I had to put together this. I did it uh, my Sunday afternoon. And then I come in this morning and look. James has given me a topic. Would you like to explain to the people what the topic is? So my topic is, I, I am calling it subscription burnout. And uh, this is basically, it's one of these things where you take a thing that is happening in your actual life and turn it into a story. Um, I I have been, like, over the last weeks, like, everybody has been turning up the screws on their subscription pricing, including Apple, who just put up the all the, all their tiers of things uh because they want to make uh some you know some more revenue some revenue it's unclear mm-hmm. and i think a lot of people are reaching the point of it being too much money and are you know doing the the thing of like well do i actually need to have this thing or do i need like five different versions of this thing right and uh I'm certainly at that point. I mean, it's not necessarily that I can't afford it. It's just that I don't think they justify the amount that a lot of these things are. And when the the leaps are, you know, it's not just, well, this is going up, you know, 10% in line with inflation or whatever. It's like, no, we're going to like go up uh, 50%, 75%. Yeah. And... uh, because it was That's all teaser happened. rates back when it was zero percent interest, so they just like yes. yeah, teaser rate. It's not. It's, we'll borrow the money. We'll pay it back later. Teaser rates, and then there's inflation, and they need to raise the rates anyway. And it's like you know, when we said six dollars, what we meant is fifteen dollars. <laughs> yeah, and Netflix 
was I think the early culprit of this, and I think pro- probably started a lot of these runs of uh, subscription rates. And you know, you get the email from Netflix saying, "And we're you know we're putting it up this much, and also, uh, you know, we're going to give you adverts now." Uh, and I'm like, "No, no, you're yeah. not." Uh, so you know, Netflix. I we cut Netflix uh, six months ago or something. And yeah, we've had a number of other services that have all said, yeah, we think that adverts are really what you want. And I'm like, no, it really is not. Yeah. Um, well, the, uh, the, we, talk, we talk about this on Downstream a lot, but the, the truth is that there's this economic challenge where there is an amount of revenue you make from each user in the ad-based system, right? Where they know, and this is assuming they sell all the ads and they sell them all at a good rate. When we talk about this, sometimes it get, we start to run away to assume that all ads are sold and they're all sold at the perfect rate, which does not happen. There are, uh, you know, I've worked at a magazine for a lot of years, like there are ad slowdowns, you have to sell below rate. But if everything's humming along, you make X amount from that person on the ad tier and they're paying, it's the amount of money you're making from them on ads and the money they're paying you because they're doing both, which my magazine, you had to pay for it and there were ads in it. It's a standard model having, you know, it's it's not unreasonable to have both ads and for you to pay. But then they look at what their ad free tier costs and they look at how much money they make per user on that and they think, oh no, we make less money on the premium product without ads because we're undercharging for it essentially. That's the lesson they take. And that that for all of us who pay for the ad free tier and I am a that inveterate pay for the ad free tier person. I am not interested in your ad tier at all. Yeah. It is terrifying because what Net- Netflix now really doesn't want you to not see ads. And so in order to get that other premium ad free version to pencil out for them, they have to raise the price kind of a lot because the ads are so successful. And it's great in the sense that I think Netflix and other places will be a little more accessible for people who are willing to watch the ads, but I'm not, and you're, I think you're not. And so you end up in a situation where now you're paying even more because the ad business has been so successful that they're going to charge you even more figuring that if you don't like it, you can just flee to the ad version. Yeah. And, and, and I think it wouldn't be so bad if we hadn't had like whatever the last decade uh you know with i don't know how long netflix has been doing their thing but you know we've we've had this ad free model for so long it's like i pay you money you give me shows yeah and uh to then like them to say you know oh but we're we're going back to pretty much the thing you fled from in the first place uh no i don't want to do that and the other thing is not you know it's also we had all the amazing shows as well because all of these people were just trying to you know get as many uh subscribers as possible yeah it was it was a gold rush they were overspending in order to get people in the door but it was a gold rush and it was also a golden age you know we had so much really good stuff and now it's like um as joe pointed out in the chat you know production has been uh down for so long because of all the strikes because they didn't want to give the you know writers and actors money either um but ended so, up giving them money after all but yes uh so yeah. what but it's gonna be thin on the ground like a, the next few months too now would be gonna a great be, time to cancel yeah there's gonna be like six months of uh whatever you know like oh yeah we haven't we haven't actually got any shows in the pipeline apart from these like two or three that we held back and that's 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 your law uh so yeah th- this is a great time to uh save money and cancel uh, all your subscriptions and it's also it's not just i mean i'm talking about tv but it's not just tv uh, software software i mean like i we will come back to like my views on developer uh, or app subscriptions but you know with things like the adobe they've been hiking their prices up and i just got an email from them saying yeah we would like vast amounts more for you know illustrator and photoshop and i use both of those things a lot in my work but i'm not using them 
like I'm not using them to a level they couldn't be replaced by something like the Affinity suite of software, which is indeed what I bought Black Friday deal this weekend because like I can pay once and I will, I can use it until it, you know, stops working. Um, Cyber weekend, uh, you were cyber, cyber dealing. That that was my cyber. Those affinities app for the people who don't know the affinity apps are so good. I I was using an ancient copy of Illustrator um, that was 32-bit, and uh, that stopped working. <laughs> I tried to use it, and, <laughs> and I, I realized, what am I doing here? And I bought Affinity Designer, which is their Illustrator equivalent, and it's great. And I only use Illustrator a very small amount, but I did use it to do like T-shirts and stuff and, we- and some podcast art. And... Um, I was, it was never going to be worth it to pay a subscription for it. And the Affinity app is just fantastic. And then on the photo, I do pay for Photoshop, and, and there are so many good photo editing apps out there, but I have 25, 30 years of, 30 yes. years of Photoshop in I my brain I think it's now. 30. I've got the same. So I'm... that one is, is still reasonably priced enough that I'm not yet willing to give up Photoshop. But everything else, sort of like in, in that, the, the Affinity, I, I just couldn't be more impressed with their, their stuff. Yeah, and and uh, a lot of the Adobe, the push is AI generative stuff, at least in the last couple of releases, um, which, you know, is worse than most of the generative AI stuff I have ever used. Uh, I, but I don't want to be funding that, really, uh, to be Fair enough. blunt about yeah. it. Uh, and I... Yeah, I've paid for Photoshop. I I paid for Photoshop like about 30 minutes before this podcast started recording because uh, our video editor, Chip, wanted some stuff and I double clicked it. It ran, launched Photoshop, which then said, oh, we had trouble with your payment, so we can't open this file. And in like my crossness, I just paid paid for it again for another year. But as you say, it's reasonably priced. $120 or something. And it's like for the app I've been using for for most of my life at this point i'm like okay fine if they if they but, continue to raise it i would i would have that moment where i'd say there are so many other options here pixelmator and and uh, i own i own most of the other options like i bought yeah. the whole affinity suite so i'm gonna play with the with the uh photoshop I, equivalent i have and pixelmator see. and acorn and i'm sure i could use the affinity photo app too like the only reason i'm using photoshop is like is inertia but boy there's a inertia there so they would have to yeah and they know it they know it but this is the risk right with with the subscription inflation is every time you increase there is a chance of churn as they call it you you, you drop off and and you may never like when i give up photoshop i think i'm never coming back right so don't push me too hard here and it was illustrator was up to i don't know it was like 280 pounds or, or something and it was like you know i can buy the entirety of the Infin- affinity suite for like 100 pounds this weekend and that leaves me like 160 extra pounds and then every year i get a free extra 280 pounds well, they're they're not a uh, they're not a sponsor but no. if, you, if you go to affinity.serif.com, they are having a Black Friday 40% off sale that's still going on. And uh, and I can endorse, certainly I can endorse Designer, but they have, th- their goal really is to sort of replicate the classic Adobe suite as apps you can just buy, uh, Designer Photo Publisher. It's, uh, um, yeah. And, and, their, and their iPad apps are, are pretty much equivalent to, which is very impressive. So, yeah. Yeah. The, so, uh, so you don't, don't, and you don't have any subscriptions in your apps, right? Mm-hmm. No, and I so as a, so I understand both sides of this because as a developer, it would be really nice if I had recurring income, uh, because you know if you bought Peacock for iOS, that's like fifteen years ago, and you know you may have tipped or, or something, but I've not charged for any updates, which is foolish, but uh, there isn't really a good way to do it, and. I, I, from a developer point of view, I would really like that because the the, the money uh, coming in regularly and you have an idea of what you're going to get and how much churn, as you say, and all that. But as a consumer, I hate them. And, yeah. and, and, and lots of consumers hate them. And 
I think there's a more of an argument if you've got a thing that is tied to a service. You know, if there's like back end servers and, you know, maybe you're paying somebody mm -hmm. else down the line for like weather data or, or something. I think there's an argument for something like uh, a calculator. Uh, right. It's harder. I mean, I, I don't I'm not saying that there is no work done because there is work done. And even just making the things keep running is a lot of work. But the it's a harder to sell a consumer on that, I think. Like, and especially now that everybody's feeling this pressure, it's like if I turned around tomorrow and I said, oh, yeah, Peacock's going to be a, a subscription now, I I I do not think that would go down particularly You would well. cancel your own subscription to yes, your own app. I, How, that's I would. outrageous. The, okay, so... I get what you're saying. There is an app that I'm not going to mention because I'm not trying to shame them because I actually think it's still a great app and I understand they need to do what they need to do. But there is an app that I have come to rely on and their new version is going to a subscription model. And it is it is not an app that has a substantial server component. They're really just saying, from now on, we want you to um, pay us. And I get the, the argument is it's continually developed, but it's a utility that the amount of value I get, I do rely on it. But I, I think about paying a subscription for it, and it just stops me cold because I, I do that. And we all do this, right? You do the calculation. What, what's the value here? If the price and the value or, or the good feeling, a lot of the subscriptions I get are the good feeling of, I love this app. I want it to keep going. And, and then I look at the price, and I think, yeah, I, for, for an app I use a lot, and yet this, this one app, I, I, it stopped me short where I thought, really? Like, this is just a utility that does this one thing. And it's like, well, no, now it's an annual thing that you spend money on to do this one thing. And it, it, I don't understand the psychology entirely because sometimes I'm very happy about it, but every now and then I see mm. one and I think this is, this is kind of pushing it. But, but the flip side of that, and, and it's something that you did, you, I, I re, I boosted you or whatever they call it on Mastodon. You did a Black Friday sale for PCALC. Still running at time of recording. Yes, okay. But here's my question <laughs> for you. You don't have a subscription plan. You don't charge for upgrades. You are putting your product on sale, and it's a product that people can only buy once. Why are you doing that? Um, to capture people who would otherwise never buy it? Is that the idea? <laughs> Basically, I, so what I have found, like, over the years is whenever you do a big sale like because i don't normally this this was an experiment this the the uh the black friday stuff but i like i did um i think for the 30th anniversary of peak Elk, i did like a 90 percent off which was you know that's silly it was like it's a dollar um and it made so much money doing that and it's not something that, you know, it's not like if it was 99 uh, cents, I would always be making that kind of money. But it's because it was a, a big deal um, and it got a lot of press and it didn't affect sales in the slightest because none of the people that bought that were the people that I haven't like sort of, uh, what's the expression? Um it's not taking anything away from the, like the regular sort of steady sales. Uh, the Black Friday thing was an experiment because I've done it for the last couple of years with Dice, which is my my standard uh, experimental uh, product, and it did pretty well. I mean, like it, you get this big bump of sales, and again, no downside that I could see. The thing is, you people then start to come to expect it, you know, and it's right. like, well, I won't buy that because I know it goes on sale, you know, every year on Black Friday or whatever. But I mean, part of it is, you know, Peacock is, it's 15 years old. Like, well, that version of Peacock is 15 years old, the iOS one. And the sales have slowed. I mean, it, it is, it is, you can't have, you know, like a, an infinite steady growth or whatever, um now you'll eventually reach everyone who would ever possibly want to buy a calculator and put it on an ios device yeah and th and then well no more sales for you so uh cannibalize future sales that was the expression uh and 
yeah, so it was it was kind of a like, well, let, let's do a thing. Let's see how this works. And, you know, it did very well. Uh, it's continuing to do very well. It will pay for Christmas. But uh, I I don't have a good I don't have good solutions to all of these things because, you know, it's it's not like a lot of this stuff is absolutely essential. And if people are starting to, you know, see everything going up in price, they're they're going to start to see, well, where are we going to make cutbacks? We're not going to buy the thing. We're not going to do this. Or we're going to wait for it to be on a deal, which was what I was counting on. And that kind of seems to have paid off. Uh, but yeah, it, it, making money is a funny old thing uh, <laughs> in, in this world. <laughs> it is. But so what do you, when you're looking at that, app and saying like i find it fascinating that it has sold as well as it has over time because it is a single purchase and if i bought so if i bought pcalc on the iphone 15 years ago i i yeah. still get it all of it right yes all yeah. of it and i know you've got like a tip jar in there but basically you have do not have a model you are continuing to keep it updated and it is your number one i would assume money maker for your business yep. mm -hmm. um and you know you do things differently and you don't have a lot of overhead you work out of your house and all of those things but like have we talk we're talking about subscriptions here remember like the, this is the why they do subscriptions and i agree a subscription for a calculator does seem like a weird thing to do but at the same time this is your job and you do need to make money on what you're and doing i think the thing is we are making the money you know like it's never been a i've never been at the point right. where you know like i'm saying sales are down but you know they're down like say i don't know 20 30 percent from the peak, the peak. Okay, of, so the, of they, what they were. So you still, there is still an ongoing flow of people who say, oh, I need a calculator. And, and 100%. So you, so you haven't it's, ex explored or you filled that entire gap of people. There are always people realizing they actually need a better calculator than what Apple has to offer. But it, but it, you can see it's slowing. Sure. Which is, you know, that that is the, you know, you, you, you can see the universe expanding out and uh right record number of of installed base and all of that plus new people come in and they and they or their needs change and they they search for it so it's it's not going to steady state but it's also not like you reach the end and there are no more sales no no so you know if if that was what it was looking for then you know i would be like yeah subscriptions they're great let's have those uh -huh. um but uh you know that that's the canary. If if I go for subscriptions, uh, things are going bad. But uh, I I just right now, you know, we're ma we're making a, a, enough money to comfortably live, and you know, you can do the maths on how long am I going to live from this point? How much money do I need? Right, um, and you don't you don't have investors who are obsessed with growth. You are doing what they I that, think they call a lifestyle business, which is a little bit silly but there it is yeah i mean it, that's the thing is like it makes us enough money to have a comfortable life and we don't have shareholders we don't have anything else um you know we can we can just kind of like uh magrathia our way through mm. this whole thing and and see how it goes but yeah i i i just you know i could make more money but to a certain extent, why? Maybe I just have a nice business well, and people like me. Look, I, I, Lauren and I had this conversation this weekend that um, there are different sort of like choices and different career trajectories. I forget who we, what we were talking about, but it, it, it came up the idea that in, in the line of work that I'm in and really the line of work that you are in, there is this question of like, life work balance and like if i wanted to maximize the m amount of money i make i would make some different choices i would enjoy my work less and work a lot more yeah and i could probably do that right i could launch new initiatives and have new stuff and 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 do stuff beyond what i'm doing now drop some of the stuff that doesn't make a lot of money that i do because i enjoy it 
um, and and focus it all. And I made the decision that I don't want to do that. Like that that I don't, I don't want to. You know, I, I I've I've been going the other way where I realize I'm working so many hours on so many projects and that I need to do less because not only will the stuff that I, that remains be better, but I will also have more energy and that's part of the the whole thing. So you do have that have that balance that you have to you have to seek, and but at the same time you also need to pay your bills and and all of that. Yeah, and and I think that that balance thing is something that certainly i've been thinking particularly over the last like four years or something because um you know the the sort of the you know last couple of years i was pushing myself harder than i should have because i wasn't feeling particularly creative you know because the the sort of global events going on around us and you know, so it's like, well, you've got to be creative. You've got to be on the cycle. You've got to have your stuff out for when Apple has their stuff out and you've got to do all the things. And I kept pushing myself and pushing myself and, and effectively I burnt out and I was fed up and I didn't want to do any of it. And uh, this year, what I did was I've done less. You know, it's like I've done stuff. I did... Um, explored interactive widgets in dice and and I've, I've been doing things and i've been playing with um vision pro things and stuff but i i don't want to say i did the minimum because i don't think i did the minimum but i did not like push myself where i was working more than was healthy um and i've kind of like i've had no uh, you know i'm taking a bit of a break just now you know i got got stuff out i've i've you know i did as I say, like me- messing with Vision Pro things, uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, I think we need time, downtime, mm-hmm. like sure. otherwise, and particularly, I will say, uh, as both of us are in our fifties, um, you get to the point of like, what is actually more important to me? You know, I, I would like to enjoy my life. I would like to, you know, not give myself a wide variety of chronic conditions that will continue until I die because I have um, pushed myself too hard on stuff. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it's finding the the balance of doing enough work. And, and work is also interesting because, you know, it is a creative outlet as well. Um, but you want to enjoy it. And I think that's the thing. It's like, you know, we've talked to a number of people we know, you know, like mentioning no names, but somebody who runs an awful lot of (laughs) (laughs) D&D. It's like, and, uh, you know, uh, said person was saying, maybe he's going to take January off from doing stuff. And I'm like, I think that's an excellent idea. Great idea. You you know, have a break. Take a break. Relax. We all, we all deserve it. And that's and, a thing t- uh, that you're doing for fun, right? And that's that's part of it, yeah. too, is I know you have ob- obligations and other people and all that, but like there, you, do, you do need to regulate yourself and watch yourself. That said, I have a, I have well, I don't want to say it's a million-dollar idea, but maybe you can tell me why this has never happened, because one <laughs> thing that strikes me is, with PCALC being the way it is, you, and you play around with graphics and stuff, what you could do is add new features and ask people to pay for the upgrade for the to unlock the new features as a revenue source within pcalc most i mean the numbers don't change right numbers are numbers they don't really change so you can't say oh 2023 the new numbers are here you need the you need to buy the new upgrade for pcalc or you're using the old numbers right i get it but um like you people out there (laughs) kids in schools even have to do graphing calculator yeah. stuff and that's not and a feature the, that you've ever put into pcalc and i've always thought like well that's an obvious I, I thought like 20 years ago well this is an obvious direction for james to go in eventually and you never have and maybe you never need to but it did strike me that if you if you made pcalc also have a graphing function you would probably be able to charge for it i mean th- there was the whole thing with the graphing calculator has been shipped on the mac for sure i'm sh- a long time um and I don't want to step on Ron's toes, but uh, it's, I think that 
I, I, you know, the, the, we will consider this. This is just between us. You know, nobody's okay. listening. Great. Um, I'm not actually like particularly excited about numbers. About math. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it, is, it, it is. It is a thing that people assume that I am like, wow, I, I must be like really big on maths. Uh, it, it's not the case. Uh, I, what I like is designing user interfaces for uh. things. And that is what gets me up in the morning is uh, I want to make a new thing. So like, for example, dice apps, you know, it's like, this is a completely different mm -hmm. uh uh you know sphere of doing things and uh it's fun to sort of like well how would the interface work for this what would be the best way to do these kind of things and that is what is interesting to me rather than the actual numbers i mean but, you've got to get the james, numbers right but james numbers graphs aren't numbers that's the beauty of it is graphs are graphics and you like graphics i know but you but heard it here first would... the vision pro p calc is going to have a virtual a uh, th full 3D grapher. Well, uh, okay, maybe that not. is not a product announcement. <laughs> no, maybe not. No, I'm just trying to guilt you into it. I get it, though. I get it. You, you know, you you wanted to build up uh, an interface and build a product, and you built a calculator, and it has become your career, which is kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, it's not like <laughs> I, I'm. I am now. I am the peak out guy or the dice guy or or whatever. Like. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I was the drag thing guy. Right. And uh, I don't think anyone remembers drag thing anymore, other than John, John Syracuse. John Syracuse, who keeps trying to replicate it with his own apps. Absolutely, he does. And, and I am, you know, it, it is one of those things that the curse is only ever truly lifted once you pass it on to somebody else. Yes. Um, and uh, I, I'm very happy for John, and I support uh, all of his uh, efforts in this field. <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah, I, I, um, I was going to ask you uh, if, if you think, if John's continued effort to slowly rebuild Drag Thing one app at a time has only convinced you that you were right to stop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really has. Uh, it's, I mean, app, Apple these days is tightening up a lot of stuff. So, you know, if you, back in the day, you could have an app that did anything at all. You know, you could hook into the lowest levels of the system and you could, you know, you, you want to like control an app in some way, you can do that, no problem. Nowadays, it's like, as you've seen, you get 15 dialogue boxes saying, this app really wants to like, you know, look at the contents of your windows or right. control this or whatever. And it's getting tedious and it's getting locked down and it's writing sort of system level utilities is like being in a war with Apple. And, you know, you just look at like the, even the, the audio hijack people, the, the, the hoops that you need to jump through when you first install that. Uh, you know, now now restart your computer, hold down this button, switch on this scary sounding thing, and then you can install it. And, you know, that, that that's one of the beauties of calculators is they just exist and they don't have to do any of these things. Uh, even Dice Apps is the same. Um, I, I, I don't miss that system utility space because no. it was just becoming hard. And I, you know, you can ask John if you perhaps have him on a podcast at any point. In a couple of weeks, maybe. Yeah, sure. Um, and you can say, does he regret <laughs> <laughs> all his choices? Sure, sure. It's just every time he tells, talks about the, the pain that he's going through in building those apps, I just imagine, I just like you appear uh, like hovering overhead, smiling happily in your retirement <laughs> to drag thing, I feel like every time. I still get I still get the emails like, you know, not often, but like I will get an email from somebody who says, I just updated my machine to whatever system after, you know, Catalina or later. And drag thing doesn't work. How do I make it work? And I go, I'm afraid to tell you. You don't. You don't. <laughs> it's an X utility. Please check yes. out these utilities from John Syracuse. Indeed. 
this episode of Upgrade is also brought to you by Notion. Notion combines your notes, docs, and projects all together in one beautiful space. And navigating that space is easier than ever thanks to Notion's new feature, Q&A. An AI assistant that can answer questions about next quarter's roadmap, find that marketing campaign proposal you're looking for, or dig up a long lost link all in seconds. Now, our friend Mike uses Notion at Cortex Brand for keeping all of the information straight for his company. He uses Notion AI to help give helpful summaries of meetings as well as provide action items. He uses the new Notion Q&A to help him find answers to questions he has about information stored within the various documents he keeps in Notion. That sounds really cool. Notion AI can now give you instant answers to your questions using information from across your wiki, projects, docs, and meeting notes. That sounds really awesome. My friend Dan Morin was talking about how he needs to put his novels into something like Notion so that he can ask an AI, uh, when did we last see this character or what color were their eyes? Because he doesn't remember and you're not going to look through multiple books in order to find it out. Let the AI do that. That's what they're for. You can ask those Q&A questions from anywhere in Notion. You can find out exactly what you need. You don't have to leave the doc you're in right now and then go over and then search. It's not here. It's not there. It's not there. You can stay focused in your document, ask the question, get an answer. It's even easier to do your most meaningful work when you can stay focused. And all your data is secure. Notion AI is designed to protect your information. No AI models are trained with your information. The data is encrypted and answers will never use information from pages you don't have access to. Try Notion AI for free when you go to notion.com slash upgrade. That's all lowercase letters, of course, N-O-T-I-O-N dot com slash upgrade to try the powerful, easy to use Notion AI today. And when you use our link, you will support the show notion.com slash upgrade. Thank you to Notion for supporting Mike and Upgrade. Time for a very uh, brief discussion of the Vision Pro before we go. I, I really wanted to get your thoughts as a developer about where we are. We're probably not a month out. We're probably a few months out from Vision Pro shipping. Um, and I, I wanted to know, but before we get to the developer part, can we talk a little bit about spatial videos? Because I think you and I have both been yeah. experimenting with, with spatial videos. We got a, a letter from Upgrading and Brandon about um, converting. There's an app that converts your spatial video shot on an iPhone to a format that lets you view it on an Oculus Quest, which I did. I think you did. Um, yeah. What did you think of that? So, I, you know, I've... I've seen a lot of uh, fairly high quality video on the, on the quest so I had an idea in my head um, and I I first did this and I I kind of I did a you know just a walk through of uh, my apartment and I looked at it and I thought well that doesn't look very good at all you know it's it's <laughs> it's a 2d video it didn't really seem to add anything and then I did another test which was to have uh, my dear wife, uh, talking at me, uh, and I, I recorded her. And that actually worked quite well because, you know, you're cl there was somebody close enough to the camera that you could get a sense of 3D separation from uh, what's around you. Uh, and, you know, it's fine, um, It but the th it's fairly obvious. I mean, it should be obvious, but uh, it's not a 180 view, which you get with a lot of the these sort of 3D uh, videos where you can, you know, look around a scene independent of where the camera was actually pointing. We we had this, not 3D, but, you know, you had your experiments with the 360 camera right. when we were recording D&D. &D. And that's, that's an interesting thing because you can, like, make a different choice to whatever the person right. was l looking at. Uh, so you can, like, look off in the corner or, or whatever. And this isn't that. You know, it is basically... It is a, uh, you know, a rectangular or square or whatever video, uh, but it has depth. It's like a, a 3D movie, effectively, like the like like the kind they used to make for the 3D televisions. Yeah. Um, and and I can see that it, you know it, it adds something to that you know to to watching a video that you you get this certain amount of depth to it. But it, it's not like you're there. Uh, it's, it, you know, I've seen some kind of fairly hyperbolic statements about how magical it is. And I'm just thinking, well, you've clearly never 
seen any decent 3D video right. before. Now, now, it may be that in the context of Vision OS, they're going to do some more processing with it because we're not watching it in Vision we OS. And and they're certainly doing things like having the fuzzy frame and all of that, mm, uh, yeah. which I think it's all there to kind of cover the imperfections in here. And look, they, 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 they're they doing what they can with this. It's 1080 at 30 frames a second, and it's not that high, so it's not that high resolution, and and you kind of need to have it as a little fuzzy edge thing. All their demo videos, or at least two of their initial demo videos, including the ones that I saw, are a uh, kid blowing out candles and people at a camp, like at a bonfire or a campfire, both of which are designed to have smoke in the foreground. <laughs> And there's a reason for that is that you can see this. There's an element hovering in the foreground with a lot of parallax to what's in the background. And it makes you go, oh, right. Like, oh, it's a 3D effect. And in the, the video that I shot, it's very similarly. If there isn't something very close in the foreground, like I was walking past people or had people sitting in front of me, that you could see the, dis the depth effect. But otherwise, it you know, you lose most of the depth and you end up with something that's just a, a 1080 video to the point where I would say, somebody asked, I, um, they said, I'm going out uh, with this, in the, uh, with a beta. This is the, sort of like a little backward details happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, and should I shoot using these uh, spatial videos? Should I shoot 3D video with my iPhone on this trip? And my thought was, you know what? Sure. If it's something where there are lots of people in the foreground or lots of elements in the foreground and, and, and near, nearby and it, you're going to get the most out of it, try some because they may be fun. But honestly, if these are precious moments, especially if they're not stuff that really benefits from this depth go, you know, co collection going on, I mean, you're better shooting it. I'd shoot a 4K. Yeah. I'd shoot at 60 yeah. frames. Like you're going to get, and I would take, I mean, take panoramas because those look great too. They're still, but they're, they're beautiful and immersive. But like if you're shooting video right now, unless it's something that really is going to benefit from 3d at 1080, 1080, 30, I would, I would probably choose for to have a 2d 4k HDR uh, and maybe 60 frames a second of that event rather than, than a 1080 yeah. P 30. And I think one thing that I don't know that there's an answer out there for is whether these things recorded on the Vision Pro are going to be 1080, 30. Because, I mean, the Vision right. Pro literally has the ability to bring in all of reality around yes. you. Oh, oh, those cameras are high resolution and they're identical. And the, the other problem here is that the iPhone has to crop the sensor yeah. on the one um, mm. because it's the, wide, uh, the ultra wide. And so the quality is degraded overall. Uh, when you put them together i'll mention if you're a six colors member joe rosensteel wrote a piece it's subscription fatigue you may not be it's fine uh, but <laughs> if you are joe rosensteel wrote a piece about this where he kind of like broke it down in detail and and said a lot of the same things we're saying here and that it's really interesting and apple is trying to get around some of the faults of it but it really does have its limitations especially on iphone and i think the most important information to walk away with is do not start taking every video you take as a spatial video because the quality isn't going to be very good. You're giving up lots of quality in order to get 3D effect. And you know what? Yeah, if you're at a birthday party for your kid and you want to take some of those videos in 3D, go for it. But I would say also then switch and take a bunch of videos at 4K um, and your preferred frame rate because um, those are going to look amazing in the Vision Pro 2. They're just not going to have depth. They're going to look amazing yeah. on your TV. They're just not going to have depth. It's okay. Not everything needs to be 3D, especially when you have to give up so much to get it. Yeah, and, and I think, the, as you say, like a 4K 60 HDR thing, I think, is going to look probably better even on a Vision Pro than the slight depth effect that you get from this what i would like apple to do is let you set a, to say i'm capturing and i think they probably they technically can't do it right now is i'm capturing spatial video and the spatial video will only be at 1080 but since i'm also using the main camera as a part of that i will also get a main camera video out at full quality in 2d that's where it should go right is you should have yeah. the maximum quality possible that you want at least out of the good camera and a degraded quality video 
that's out of both cameras. But I don't think they can do that right now. I, or, or if they can, they can't. The, like the amount of post processing required, uh, it's not worth it. But like that's really what this feature should be: is you shouldn't have to make the choice. You should be able to shoot it at 4K in the one camera and then generate a 1080 out of it, out of both cameras and stereo. But the framing change, they're, they're, I get that there are lots of issues there, but like that's the ideal is you should not have to, users should not have to make this choice, but that's where we are right now is users will have to make this choice. Uh, the, there's people selling, you know, like these little 3D cameras. Uh, I would like to see Apple do something that its entire point of it is to shoot spatial, spatial video. video. Oh. It's just a small thing, and you know it doesn't have to be. I, I don't uh, think I don't think Apple even needs to make it. I think if Apple finds good partners who who they can hmm. sell at the Apple Store, saying here is a great thing to capture spatial video for Vision Pro, and it works with Vision Pro, thumbs up, seal, licensing program, all those things that they are good at doing. I think yeah. that would be a, a great way. Even if they if they don't necessarily even have to make the product, they just need to find a partner who can sell that product and i agree although again your point you mentioned that i brought a 360 camera to portland when we did the incomparable get together and we played D and there's actually a a um I'll, I'll see if i can uh put it in the in the show notes because it's, it's just public now um there's a 360 video we did on youtube and if you watch that inside an oculus quest or whatever meta quest um you're you're sitting on the table <laughs> you're like a very small person <laughs> standing on the table while we play D and and you can just and, and and there's no director, there's no camera angle. You just look around and see what people are doing, and that's immersive. It's 2D, but it's immersive in a completely different way. But still, it's really immersive and interesting. So like there, it, there there's not a single answer here. Like a gorgeous 4K HDR, 60 frames a second video is going to have a lot of feelings of like realism and you were there that a 3D video at 1080 is not going to have, and a 360 video is going to have an immersion level that that, that other uh, video is not going to have. So there's like there's no one right or wrong answer here. There's a lot of different stuff you can choose from. Yeah, but I, I would, I imagine that is one of these things that is going to get better over time, and, you know, this, this is what they can do with the current hardware, and if it becomes oh, sure. a, a thing... You know, like they could turn iPhones into, you know, like very high end uh, stereo capture sure. things. Sure, sure. I mean, depending on, on the technology and the price and all of those things, I, I'm sure they're discussing whether there's a future iPhone that has a much more capable, like this is kind of a hack, right? I appreciate that they did it, but it, it is kind of a hack to get it to do this at all. And it's great that it does it. It is really cool. It's a cool idea. Because you're out yeah. and about, you're probably not wearing a Vision Pro. Um, speaking yeah. of which, so as a developer, talking about the the headset itself, what um, what's your experience been? What are your what are your quick thoughts about sort of like where where Vision OS is right now? So again, this is my my standard canary that I do not have a Vision Pro uh, developer kit. I know yes. you were saying on previous weeks that some people are starting to get them. It's unclear whether like the Shall we say smaller indie developer right. types, or if it's are just big, them. bigger companies? Yeah, yeah. Because I can imagine you start out with the, you know, like the Disney's and the whatever, and then you work your way down. But yeah, I don't have anything yet, and it's. I would say if you are building a complicated three D app and you don't have a developer kit, it is tough, you know, because the the more like the more complex, the more interactions you're doing, the more distant the experience of using the vision pro uh developer kit or sorry the simulator is uh if you're building a 2d stuff like taking your existing apps i think it's entirely doable you know there are still things to consider in terms of the interactions um because i've been thinking about this it's like you know it seems like only yesterday but 15 16 years ago when we were building iphone apps in the simulator and nobody had an iphone right you know, it's the, well, I f know how it might feel and I will build this thing. And then as soon as I got like with Peacock, so I got it onto an actual iPhone in my hand. I'm like, this doesn't work well like this. You know, <laughs> I, I, if the, the, the kind of interaction model of you holding it in your hand and tapping on it 
it's not the same as you clicking with your mouse and moving a cursor around. And while the Vision Pro, there is a kind of effectively you're moving a cursor around because you're looking, um, it's not it's not one to one. And 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 I think I I mean, had I had the experience of being a, an Apple developer kitchen. Um, I think I'm allowed to say that it was actually, um, you know, you get the, you realize that, yeah, oh, this is different. Um, there are things that are important that I'm not doing that just don't, it's not really an issue on an iPad. Um, and I think there's going to be that f the first run of apps is there's going to be a lot of stuff where it's like, to make an analogy it's like when the first catalyst app shipped you know you can you can you can take take the box and you can ship an app but is it the best app for the platform that you're going on and i think over time people will kind of uh realize more what is what is important what's not as important uh and i think things will get better on on that front I mean, I've got, like, my apps are running happily. My apps ran day one. Uh, there's still things in them that I don't think are the best way of doing things. Can you just drop and bananas? Do they drop bananas out into the world in a random way? Are they in Windows? I, or are you playing with 3D space, you know, rolling dice in so, 3D spaces, having a physic like a floating calculator that looks like a calculator, stuff like that? So I have, all of the above has been tried to some degree or another. <laughs> like, the, um, like, I have thrown bananas in in augmented reality oh, it, it you're living is a the thing dream that has happened and i will tell you those bananas look great okay. <laughs> there, there, there is a certain amount of like i spent an unrealist not just bananas the dice i've spent an unrealistic amount of time uh making perfect little 3d models of dice mm. and to see those like as a real as a real thing or as, as close to a real thing as you can get is pretty amazing because you know you, you move your head just slightly and like all the the reflections on them change and it's like those look real mm. and uh that's really it is a really amazing thing to to see these things it's like 3d printing it and putting it in front of you um but the question like so i think like the Vision Pro is probably one of the most impressive pieces of technology that I've used. Yeah, full stop. Um, right. It's got so much stuff which is ahead of like other headsets because you know we've both got our our Meta Quests and yeah. and things like that, and it's way better than that. Uh, I am still not a hundred percent sure what the use cases right which is which is a different thing and i'm sure apple is having this same kind of thought and and i'm you know i'm 100 going to do my apps for it and i'm going to see where this goes uh because i think it is an extremely interesting space but do i think it's a sure bet no um but but still the technology is so cool and they've done so much with it and even not just the technology the software you know the software is really good the the um the way that they've sort of adapted the the developer apis into 3d and done things is is very interesting uh it just comes down to i'm waiting to see the killer app for this thing i don't think it's going to be a calculator I'm not even sure it's going to be a dice app, although the dice app might look cool. Um, but what is going to be the thing? And I think things will come, but it's just a question of, you know, w will the interesting apps turn up enough, turn up fast enough right. for this thing? Yeah. It's going to be an interesting year, year next year, isn't it? Oh, definitely. <laughs> I mean, like, the, the, I, I was quite glad the rumors are, you know, that this thing is probably not going to be January. You know, we're probably more talking March or right. something. 
And it's like, that's good, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend basically January and February and whatever of March working on this stuff. Because I think that that's my plan for the start of this year is to, I mean, I've been doing things, but I'm really going to sort of like uh, take this, make make the the best apps that I can at that point. And that will be, and then we'll see where it goes. Uh, and I think it'll be fascinating. Uh, and maybe it's going to be this amazing thing and uh, it's going to find a place or maybe it's not. Maybe and not. I don't know the answer. Yeah, nobody does. That's the beauty of it. Whatever happens, yep. it's going to be a surprise and I think can't be predicted right now really because something will catch on or nothing will or it, it should be really interesting to watch. Well, yeah, and I think that's a good space like for us to be in. I mean, like, because we don't know what the answer is and and that's interesting. Well, James, it has been a pleasure having you in Upgrade as a uh, participant instead of just a listener and in the chat room, which you frequently are. Thank you for well, that. Well, it, it is always a pleasure. Um, it is always mildly traumatic to to be on one of these flagship podcasts, but I, f I try and uh, it's always fun. We we raised the flag today and it just had bananas on it. I don't know what that's about. So <laughs> it's a sign that you're here somewhere. He got to us. He, he substituted the usual upgrade play with a banana. Uh, yeah. You you can find James. James, tell people where they can find the things you want to plug right now. Well, um, as was stated, if if you act now, uh, you can get uh, Peacock and Dice at fifty percent off uh, from if you go to peacock.com. Just follow the links there. Um, if you follow me on, usually Mastodon is probably the place that people will find me at. And I'm uh, James Thompson on Mastodon.social. Thompson without a P. Uh, yes. And I'm also, I'm on everything else as well. And all the social networks are weird. Yes. Uh, Mastodon seems like the one that has got more most of the tech people on it. Right. It doesn't have all the fun people on it. No. But... Uh, just but live, yeah, I'm on, live, living in a fractured world now. I, I'm stress panda on threads. Okay, that's very good. Uh, of course, you can send us your feedback, uh, your follow-up, and your questions at UpgradeFeedback.com. Didn't do any Ask Upgrade today, but it'll be back next week when Mike is back. Uh, you can also check out my writing. I am at SixColors.com. Podcast here at Really FM, of course, over at TheIncomparable.com. Doctor Who Flashcast is back. We're doing, Dan Moore and I are doing For All Mankind on the NASA Vending Machine podcast with every episode. Lots of that stuff going on. That's that stuff that I do for fun and not for money, by the way, that I mentioned <laughs> earlier, because it's fun to talk to my friends about stuff that I'm excited about. Uh, you can also find me on Mastodon, Jay Snell, at Zeppelin.flights. Uh, Mike always says that I'm on threads. I'm really not. Not yet. <laughs> Maybe not ever, but we'll see. And check out our videos. We have a YouTube channel. We're on TikTok and Instagram. It's Upgrade Relay on all of those things. Uh, and we do often post the full show as well as some fun clips. And I know I've heard from a bunch of people who that their preferred way to listen to podcasts is to have it playing in YouTube. And occasionally you glance over and see that there are humans saying those words. And we are... <laughs> Working on that one. We're going to work on that one. Uh, thank you to our members who support us with UpgradePlus.com. Thanks once again to our sponsors for this week's episode, Memberful, Ladder, and Notion. And, of course, as always, thank you for spending your time with us today. Until next week, James Thompson, say goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.